Hello everyone and welcome to the Here to Stay Black, Latina and Afro-Latina Women in Construction Trades Apprenticeships and Employment Webinar. My name is Lark Jackson and I am the Program Director for Chicago Women in Trades' National Center for Women's Equity in Apprenticeship and Employment. And I'm glad that you all can join us today in exploring the unique challenges and also the opportunities for Black, Latina and Afro-Latina women in the construction trades. CWIT's National Center and the Institute for Women's Policy Research collaborated on the Here to Stay brief with trades women all around the country, providing their insight, candor, and aspirations for this work. I would like to thank these trades women for making this work possible. I would also like to thank my colleagues at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Chandra Childers, Ariane Hezewish, and Eve Medford, and my Chicago Women in Trades colleagues, Lauren Sugarman, and Chicago Women in Trades' Racial Equity Committee for lending their exp expertise to this brief. Last but not least, this brief was supported by funding from the US Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship with additional support from the WK Kellogg Foundation. Thank you all for your support. Today, we will be continuing to amplify the voices of tradeswomen and provide recommendations on best practices to support them. Next slide, please. Today, General President Ken Rigmaiden from the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades will jumpstart our program and Chandra Childers from the Institute for Women's Policy Research will provide an overview of the research within the brief. We will then hear from tradeswomen and women in leadership positions in their unions about their recommendations for how the construction industry can be more inclusive and provide more opportunities for Black, Latina, and Afro-Latina and other tradeswomen of color to thrive and to lead. Next slide, please. Before we hear from General President Ken Rigmaiden, let's review some housekeeping rules. Please submit questions for the panelists through the Q&A feature where you can ask or view questions by clicking on the Q&A icon. If you have technical issues, please comment in the chat, or you can also email medford at iwpr.org. Please mute yourself so that we have no background noise while our speakers are presenting. This webinar will also be recorded and will be available on IWPR's website. We will also send it to all attendees post-webinar. And finally, please remember to tweet hashtag tradeswomen ha here to stay and hashtag tradeswomen. Again, that's hashtag tradeswomen here to stay and hashtag tradeswomen during this <laughs> webinar. And now please join me in welcoming General President Ken Rigmaiden from the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. He began his career with the IU PAT in 1977, enrolling in the floor covering apprenticeship training program of local union 1288. General President Ken Rigmaiden ultimately took on the position of executive general vice president for the IUPAT in 2002 
and was unanimously elected to the office of general president by the IUPAT General Executive Board on March, in March, 2013. Without further ado, President Rig Maiden. Well, thank, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to this erstwhile group today, uh, particularly when we talk about the President building Rigman, and construction trades. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to me. I believe you're muted. Am I muted? It doesn't look <laughs> like I'm muted. No, I think you're good, Ken. Am I, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, thank you very much. I we appreciate the opportunity Sorry, to address this we group today. Uh, actually, it's a little bit of history here for me. When I hear about the opportunities and the challenges that women in the trades, particularly women of color, women of Latin background are having, it reminds me of my father and my father-in-law who were both building tradesmen. And my father came out of the uh, military, military war of uh, World War II. My father-in-law came out of the Korea Institute and both of them came back uh, from the war, ready to go to work in a building trades. And in California in the 1946, 47 period, uh, it was still difficult for a person of color to, to get a job, let alone join a union. Some of you may have heard some of this stuff where a person has to not only get a job, but join a union. And my father in particular ran through that. And finally, after going through a process that no one should have to go through, he was able to get in, indoctrinated into his union in the back office because they didn't really allow colored people uh, in the union. That and the notion that when you became a union member, you at least were able to get the same wage that any other person in the union got. But those challenges that my old man faced are the same kind of challenges in a, in a more limited position that I faced and are the same kind of challenges that women in the trades are facing today. Those same kind of challenges that are somewhat insulting, uh, not believing in the, the concept of all pe people deserve an opportunity, which is supposed to be the American dream, and in some ways, I feel like this is a little bit of a redux, but the reason I'm here is just because of that, that I wish and I pray that no one would have to go through those same issues, but here we are going through those same kind of issues of trying to be recognized in the ability to work in a trade and make a living just like any other American. Um, Again, to be here and to be able to recognize women in the trades, particularly women of color in the trades, this is absolutely an opportunity. And I hope to learn uh, from this, this session to helpful and be helpful to my union and the women that are in the IUPAT. And I got to tell you this. When I talk about people who want to get involved in the structure of their union and some of the work groups that I have, like I have a, a, a women's work group, I have an African-American work group, I have a young worker work, work group, I have a Latin work group, and the women seem to be the most engaged and really want to get something done. So I think the future looks very good, but it does take leadership from the top to make sure that that happens. And I'm very proud that I'm one of those folks that is really trying to make sure that that happens. However, there's work to be done. And not only do we need women in the trades to become members, but to also become leaders. Because myself becoming the general president of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, I'm not going to say it was easy, but I am going to say it was opportunity and really pressing to do it. 
and to press that opportunity, it's going to take the women who are engaged and want to make something happen for their union. And I'm proud to say in the IUPAT that we have some folks who will come in leadership positions as well as journey workers who are working. I'm also pleased that the IUPAT has just approved programs that support women in the trades. Uh, maternity leave, we just endorsed that and approved it. Uh, so that's another good thing for folk that come into the union. And we're trying to do our best to make sure that women in the IUPAT have the full opportunity that men have, that black men have, that Latin men have, that white members have, but just that we're all on an equal playground. That's why I'm glad to be here and I wish you nothing but best on this and I wanna hear and listen so I can improve myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Rick Maiden. Please join me now in welcoming Chandra Childers, PhD and study director at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Chandra was instrumental in conducting the research for this brief and she will be sharing an overview of it. Chandra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Lark, I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank you all for joining us. And I also do wanna thank the US Department of Labor and the Kellogg Foundation as well. I wanna start out by providing a little background on the research and providing an overview of our research findings. The briefing paper that we, um, that we are talking about today comes out of a partnership between the Chicago Women in the Trades and the Institute for Women's Policy Research. We have been working together since 2016 to better understand the new generation of tradeswomen who are more diverse than previous generations have been. In 2018, for example, 32% of tradeswomen were Latina, 8% were Black, and 3% were Asian. To better understand the factors that facilitate their access, retention, and advancement in the construction trades, we conducted focus groups with early career unionized trade women from across the country. The women we talked with had at least two years of experience as apprentices, but no more than three years at the journey level. Um, when we spoke with them, one of the most common reasons they gave for entering or remaining in the trades is that these were jobs that pay well and were accessible through apprenticeships that paid them from their very first day on the job. These jobs, they pay more than traditionally female jobs, including some that require a college education. So the higher earnings in these jobs, it helps lift women and their families out of poverty. It provides them with economic security. It allows them to save money for their future, to provide for their children, to go to college, and to purchase homes of their own. One apprentice that we spoke to, she described what this means for her and her family in this way. I'm a single mother and I have to provide for my kids. My oldest just graduated college and I help pay for her school. I have a 16 year old and a 10 year old and nobody really knows this, but I just bought a house a month ago. Without the trades, I wouldn't have ever been able to accomplish this. This was a common sentiment with the women we spoke with. This is all the more important because historically and today, Black and Latina women face discrimination in both housing and labor markets, and they're disproportionately concentrated in low-wage female-dominated jobs that don't allow them to build up savings or provide for their family's basic needs. This means that they are much less likely than their white counterparts to be able to purchase a home of their own. However, several of the women we spoke with had recently bought a home after joining the trades. Next slide. And it's not just the higher earnings that trade 
trans women appreciated about the traits, but also the benefits, including health insurance, which allows them to keep more of their earnings. So while the need for everyone to have health insurance has been an issue of debate in this country for decades, the COVID crisis has really highlighted the desperate inequality in health insurance coverage and in access to quality health care. Fortunately for the tradeswomen we spoke with, health insurance is a standard benefit for unionized apprentices and journey level workers. One apprentice explained it this way. I just got a statement from a stay in the hospital and it was like half a million dollars. I was, oh my God, what if I don't, didn't have, the fact that I have a bill that large and I don't have any out-of-pocket expenses is a blessing. And now I have my daughter and she has those benefits. It's a blessing. Next slide. While the earnings and benefits were important for all the women we spoke to, they also all spoke about their love for the work that they do in the construction trades. They talked about loving the job, the challenges it poses, and being good at the work that they do. One apprentice described her love for her job this way. I love my job. I love the challenge. I love the fact that in my job, we do a lot of problem solving. Every task we have, there's problem solving. Nothing ever fits right. Nothing ever works. I love that part. I love the fact that we change sites, that I get to jump from job site to job site, finish it. Once it's done, you go somewhere else. And the reason I stay is because I'm good at what I do. In addition to loving the work, they also talked about what it meant for them to be role models for their children, their nieces, and even the other women that they meet as they go about their daily lives. One woman we spoke to talked about taking photographs of her work because her daughter was so proud that her mom was an electrician. However, in spite of all of the benefits of working in the trades, the women we spoke with also talked about some of the difficulties that they face as women generally, but as Black, Latina, and Afro-Latina women specifically. Next slide. And I do want to note up front that attitudes toward women in the trades have undergone significant changes over the last 30 years as women have increased their presence. But despite that progress, many Black, Latina, and Afro-Latina tradeswomen describe some work environments as being less than welcoming and others facing ongoing discrimination and harassment, which makes it difficult for them to develop the skills they need to be successful in their chosen trade. One of the first difficulties they talked about was isolation, being the only woman and possibly the only person of color at a work site. That means that whether coworkers are friendly or hostile, they feel as being, being the only woman on a site that they are being watched and judged constantly. Being the only woman on a work site also means, for example, that they don't have easy access to bathrooms. It means that the tools and equipment that they work with, it's not designed for them, and that can be dangerous for them in the work that they do. They also spoke about um, the, op the other obstacles, including racial and sexual harassment. Next slide. So one tradeswoman, a Black apprentice, described her experience when she was on new job sites. This was a common experience she had. When you're a Black woman walking in and the foreman sees you and he knows you're an apprentice and he's like, oh God, we must have needed a woman minority city resident. I'm like, no, I actually know how to weld. Next slide. Another apprentice, a Black immigrant, described her experience, which highlights the need to address retention as much as access. I went to the shop steward and told him that I was doing fire stopping as a third year apprentice and a first year male apprentice was doing conduit work. They sent me to another foreman and he was like, are you legal in this country? You need speech for your accent, things like that. And I became so drained. I became depressed and I thought, oh my God, this is not for me. Not receiving the full range of training in addition to the harassment about race and speech are very common for the women that we spoke with. They detailed difficulties in trying to get the training that they needed. And for those who had already journeyed out, they talked about how limited training during an apprenticeship can limit their options as a journey level worker because they don't have the skills that they were expected to learn before they became journey level. 
This is a critical issue in the trades and it's one of the mo most common ways that Black, Latina and Afro-Latina women among other groups are undermined. They're not allowed to fully develop their skills and that is then used against them as a reason they should not be in the trades. Ensuring that every apprentice is fully trained is really crucial. Next slide. And not only are Black and Latina women denied access to training, they also experience sexual harassment. Now, perhaps not report sexual harassment as a major issue. Yet, when they did experience it, especially when they were apprentices, they often felt that they had few options to actually address it. So one, of, one, apprentice, one apprentice we spoke with made the following statement. There had been a a young a man on the site who had repeatedly asked her out and she had turned him down. He got her alone one day and he began physically touching her. When asked if she reported the event, she said no, that she didn't. And she made the following statement. I'm probably going to be the one to get moved to another job just so that they can keep him there because they need him. I'm an apprentice. I felt kind of expendable at that point. What, I'm going to get a lawsuit, get some money, and then what? Am I going to have a job to come to? Or am I going to be blackballed in the business? They will say she likes to sue. And so that was a real problem for apprentices who are unable or feel that they're unable to stand up for themselves. Next slide. In addition to difficulties getting quality training and the indignities of harassment, women also talked about difficulties getting overtime. One tradeswoman described her experience. It seems like women must fight to advance and to learn new aspects of the trade that men get automatically. Just for me to get overtime on Saturdays was like, I had to ask my male partner to ask the foreman for me, to kind of vouch for me, to say, yeah, she could do it. Other than that, women don't get overtime. Many of the women that we spoke with indicated that they could overcome some of these difficulties that they experienced during their apprenticeships when they would show their male coworkers that they could handle the job. However, that these were often women who found men who would mentor them and ensure that they did learn their trade. However, even in those instances, they also reported that at every new job, they often had to prove themselves again, while men who were new to the job were assumed to be competent and there to work. While harassment and discrimination was common for most of the tradeswomen we spoke with, women with young children faced additional obstacles. While most of the women we spoke with did not, did not have children or their children were adults when they entered the trades, women with small children struggle to find quality affordable childcare that's available during the hours that they work. One journey woman described her experience when she first became an apprentice. When I got an apprenticeship, it was the hardest time because I'm paying family members to babysit. I'm buying food for the house, but they it still didn't matter. They say, well, I don't feel like it tonight. So at one point I had to tell my kids, look, all we got is each other. Y'all going to be in this house while I go to school. Just do not let the youngest girl go in the kitchen because she might burn herself. And even when their children are in school during those hours, having a sick child could also create a crisis. Next slide. One woman we spoke to noted that phone call, kids are sick, depending on who you're working with, it may or may not be frowned upon. Why are you answering the phone? What is this? Do you need to leave? Is this too much for you? Can you deal with this? She noted that while some foremen understood and even encouraged women to take the time they needed to care for their children, others were hostile to women taking the time off. While childcare was the most common obstacle for the trades women with young children, other issues raised included accommodations during pregnancy and access to maternity leave. And those were just some of the obstacles that women faced. Next slide. More than 300,000 women work in the construction trades as electricians, as carpenters, plumbers, and sheet metal workers. Yet women make up just 4% of all workers in construction occupations. The data in the briefing paper highlights the fact that it isn't enough to improve women's access, but we must also work on their retention and advancement in the trades. 
some organizations such as Chicago Women in the Trade, such as the non-traditional employment for women in New York and other women-focused pre-apprenticeship programs are working to increase women's access to the trades. Between 2016 and 2019, the number of black women in federally registered apprenticeships has increased by more than 50% and the number of Latinas has almost doubled. Despite this growth, all women make up just 3% of all federally registered apprenticeships, which include those in the construction trades. Now, federal policymakers are focusing on investments in infrastructure, and jobs in construction are projected to grow across the nation. It's critical that apprenticeship programs expand to include more women, especially Black, Latina, and Afro-Latina women. As noted above, these are jobs that provide workers with middle class earnings. Median earnings for unionized construction workers, for example, are over $1,100 per week. That is more than women elementary and middle school teachers earn, and they're required to have a bachelor's degree or more. And it's a lot more than the median earnings for all women workers, many of whom are concentrated in low wage female dominated jobs. So this is a time to really begin to focus on increasing women's access to jobs in the construction trades and making sure that women who enter the trades are able to stay in and that they're able to advance into leadership positions. Next slide. Thank you all for your time. Please check out our briefing paper for more details. And I will now hand it back over to Lark so that she can let the trades women speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you so much for that overview. Now we will hear from tradeswomen Rochelle Walker, a field organizer with DC51 IUPAT in Maryland, Monica Yamada, a sheet metal worker from Local 104 in Fresno, California, and Zara Hill, a journeywoman licensed plumber with Local 130 in Chicago, Illinois. What advice would I give a woman age of color in the trades who is considering leaving due to marginalization? Uh, well, in my experience, marginalization happens in every industry. Uh, it's a shame to use that as an excuse to leave a job you love. I know sometimes it feels like I'm alone and a lot of the times I am. Uh, for the first three years of my apprenticeship, I was the only female apprentice. Uh, today, there are four women on the job site. So um, I have to stop and remember how blessed I am. I love my job. It's given me the financial ability to take care of my family and seeing women retire reminds me that I can do 30 years. I know uh, this fight started way before I got here, but staying connected and joining social groups um, really helps me out. Being able to see the experiences of other women it always reminds me that I'm not alone and you just have to keep building up. What recommendations would I give to construction RAPs, uh, contractors and other industry stakeholders and how to best support trade women of color? Uh, take note of individual abilities. A good leader is creating a great team. As a woman of color, I am not trying to mimic a man. Uh, I'm a woman, so my physique is different, my demeanor is different, but as we all know, work ethics do not discriminate. So all I ask is that you give me the opportunity and not hinder my ability to complete that job. I am happy to see women are now taking on leadership roles, and it is important to give other women yeah, the opportunity yeah. and advancement. So please, listen to your female counterparts. We are here to work and get the job done as quickly and as cost efficiently as possible. Again, we are just here to work. My name is Zara Hill and I'm a plumber out of Chicago, Illinois, local union 130. 
I am the mother of two boys to whom I gave birth to while in the construction trade. One of the most challenging obstacles I faced as a mother was not after I had my children, but before, during my pregnancy. In the construction industry, there is no such thing as maternity leave, and there should be. There's a need for it. I struggled to find balance between when I should leave or when I could leave, or if I could leave. Work would miraculously get slow once I told my company that I was pregnant. So I did what a lot of women do, unfortunately, and I hid it. I hid my pregnancy from my employer and I hid it from my coworkers. It was the winter time, so I wore a few extra layers of clothes. I thought that the longer I concealed it, the longer I could work because the company, once they found out, it would have been the end of my career. I found myself having to choose between starting a family and my career. And that's not a choice that any woman should ever have to make because we can have both. I seek counsel from one of my union brothers and he told me, okay, you're pregnant, what's the big deal? And as I sat there with my mouth to the floor, he looked at me and said, Sarah, what's the difference between you being pregnant and needing light duty and a guy spraining his ankle and needing light duty? Pregnancy is temporary. Have your baby, get back to work. And that's exactly what I did. I worked up until 36 weeks, which was my choice. My union hall offered something called temporary disability. And with temporary disability, I was able to take off for a total of six months with referrals from my doctor and an additional six months with an approved physician of their choice. That time was everything. Being able to take it when I wanted and when I needed was great. The pay, however, was not the best. But at that time, it was better than nothing. The same situation happened with my second child. But due to complications, I could only work up until I was 20 weeks with the same option of disability. But we're not disabled. We're pregnant. And we just want what anyone joining the trades want. And that's to be able to afford to start and take care of a family. Being a tradeswoman of color has definitely impacted the work I've done here at the IPAT. When I was an apprentice, I learned very quickly that there weren't many women in the trades and not many women knew that the trades existed, let alone that they would be capable of this type of work. Uh, so I took it upon myself to personally uh, advocate for not just my union, but for construction trades overall to women that I would meet uh, in the grocery store or uh, in my neighborhood who were curious to know why I was in all white or what I did for uh, a profession. And I was surprised to hear a lot of women who didn't know that this existed, but I also could relate to that fact as well. Uh, so as a union organizer now, uh, I make it my business to uh, not only promote, but advocate for the women that are already within the trade, but advocate for the women who are not, who might be looking at this as a viable option because it is. So many women are looking for that financial independence and are normally led to you know, jobs that are not paying as much, don't have that flexibility to actually grow. And with this being not only a family but self-sustaining career option, they have the capacity and, and all of the capabilities of being very successful within this market, no matter how old you are or, or what path you've taken in life, that this is not only an option, but you can definitely thrive in this if you're willing. And if I can be that advocate for that woman behind me, uh, Hopefully she won't have to deal with the adversity or as much adversity as I or the women before me have dealt with. What recommendations would you give to construction reps, contractors, and other industry stakeholders on how to best support trades women of color? Well, one of the things, if I only had one thing to say, would be uh, just them recognizing the value of advocating for change, advocating for diversity within their individual companies or industries. I feel like if they just just focus on the value that diversity brings and that trades women of color bring, having that support system 
um, not just through other tradeswomen, but through their male counterparts goes a long way. And uh, once there's more of a buy-in to uh, the notion that women of color are welcomed within these industries, I feel that it will help propel more women to look at this and say, hey, maybe I can do this. Maybe I, I do want to give this a try. I do want to give this a shot uh, and help, you know, eliminate, you know, the pressure of feeling like this is a male dominated field and I'm not going to be well received. So why even try? Please give a virtual round of applause for Monica, Zara, and Rochelle. I should note that these trades women were not able to be in person with us today due to their work schedules, but they were gracious enough to offer their perspectives via these pre-recorded messages. So again, thank you. Now let's shift gears a bit and hear from women in leadership positions in their unions. Angela McDaniel, Apprenticeship, Diversity and Inclusion Lead at the US Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship will moderate. Angela. Thank you, Lark. Uh, I am so ecstatic to be here and help with this presentation. Um, I think you all will enjoy um, what the leaders are uh, have to say. It is so fitting that this is Women's um, Women's Month, History Month, and we are creating history every um, day. So I'm so great. I'm grateful that uh, see what used our funds to produce this information and that we can share. So let us not just celebrate Women's History Month. I think I'm preaching to the choir, but let's make sure that we include other celebrations of all the great works of women uh, throughout the year. So we're gonna um, first look at a video from Lily uh, uh, Collateral, and she is going to uh, speak to leadership in advancing leadership. So let's uh, hear this, the presentation right now. And then we will have some other leaders speak directly. Thank you. How did I get involved in the trades? And once in the trades, how was I able to move into leadership? I got involved in the trades by first connecting with Chicago Women in Trades. From there, I was able to make an informed decision about which branch of trade I really wanted to get into. I didn't think about Brick Lane uh, as my first choice. Actually, it was carpentry. But once I was able to touch uh, a trowel and get the feel of it and feel the mud, uh, it was love at first sight. Um, <laughs> Uh, I believe what helped me become a leader is by having the drive to be more than just a bricklayer, to by having people who believe in me and my aspirations um, to become more than just that. Uh, I wanted to learn my trade. I wanted to teach my trade. And I also wanted to get as many people involved with my trade and in all trades, really, um, as much as I want, as much as I believed in it. Um, it's always good to network with the allies and to talk to other women, uh, to share stories, uh, to get aspirations. Um, I wanna be able to show my other sisters that we can be more than just the bricklayer. We can be foremans, superintendents, safety leaders, and much more. Um, having this goal is what moved me to be into leadership. Uh, along with that, the support of my sisters in the trade and those male allies that saw that driving me. What systematic change would I like to see in the industry implement, see the industry implement to better recruit, retain, and support trace women of color? Um, you know, I think um, if we were able to hold our contractors accountable for hiring uh, of women, of women of color, we might see a change in the number of women that are hired. Uh, what that means is we need to get language into our PLAs, our our project labor agreements and our CBAs, collective bargaining agreements, uh, where we can hold our trainer cent training centers and our contractors accountable. Uh, maybe having language where in some areas you would have to reach out to organizations like CWIT, ANU, and others who have those resources resources to fa facilitate the hiring of more women, especially women of color, um, 
in this way, we can eliminate the common, well, we can't find these women. Um, by having them reach out to the community centers and organizations that have um, an outreach to women of color and that are ready and willing to, to get into the trades, uh, we can eliminate that excuse, right? Um, we don't just want to meet a quota. We need that language that is inclusive of, of women, especially women of color. We're often the last to get hired and the first to get laid off. Um, there's something really wrong with that. Um, the ability to see other women of color in different leadership roles is crucial. And the industry, I think, must reimagine their workforce. Um, we are vast and we can make up the shortage of workers given a fair chance. Um, as far as retention, I think if uh, more of our unions actively supported the creation of women groups where we can have a safe space to talk, share, and um, get the much needed support from each other, um, the unions have to basically step up and do their share. Uh, I'm doing, in doing so, we can retain more women and therefore we can recruit more, uh, recruit more and then the more we recruit, the more we are visible to other women, uh, they will essentially want to take part in it and uh, want to get into the trade and, you know, our numbers can grow from there. What can we or should we do to make sure that Black women and Latinas are benefit from the jobs created through uh, the American Rescue Plan? Uh, like I said before, we need to get our get to work on getting language in our PLAs and our CBAs uh, be more, to be more diverse and inclusive, to include women of color. Um, it's a win-win in my eyes uh, for us, the industry to invest in women, um, women, especially women of color, favor unions. Um, so imagine if we can reach more women and employ them and retain them, then we can be a voice to be reckoned with. with pro-union power, we can do a lot more. Um, but we should be pushing to get more women on these projects, especially with this uh, American Rescue Plan. Um, we're gonna, they're gonna need a workforce. And here we are, we're ready to work. And I think uh, we just need our voices to be heard. So thank you, Lee, Lily. Um, we're gonna ask all our panelists to turn on their uh, cameras at this particular time so we can go through the questions. First question is going to be around Robin. I'm so glad that Lily mentioned about entry level jobs in leadership. So we just don't wanna, of course, keep women in leadership positions. We want to, if they wanna move up, move up journeymen and also leadership uh, jobs because they could that's where and I think Ken mentioned that that's where they have an impact on policy implementation and leadership of, of different particular programs and they can deal with uh, women having being able to work and having positive policy implementations um, at that particular level influ influential um, positions also not just the uh, the, uh, the the layman, but leadership position. So we're gonna to move to Wendy first, and we're gonna ask each person the same question. How can the industry provide more opportunities for trade women of color to advance into leadership roles? Wendy? Well, first and foremost, um, we need um, male allies. You know, that's how I was able to elevate myself from just being someone working in the field to where I'm at today. Um, there's a shortage of women, so we have to lean on our men and not every brother that you're working next to don't want you there. Some of them do appreciate you and um, they will speak up for you, you know. And um, in order for us to get those male allies, we have to be good workers, be good at what we do. and. Um, Demand the respect, you know, when things aren't right, don't be afraid. I always tell the sisters that um, communication is important. When, when things don't feel right, express that. You know, if um, you're having a bad day or you're not sure how your boss may feel about you at the end of the day, ask them how you doing and let them know what your um, concerns are and what you're looking to get out of the program that you're in or the job site that you are on. If you don't have that dialogue, sometimes they don't know. 
And when people are making you uncomfortable, don't hold it, you know, and think that, um, you know, I don't want to make any waves. You, Cause you're making waves by holding it. The best thing to do is let it out so that everybody understands that it's not acceptable. And I'm here to work with you, not work against you. And um, really not important if we're not gonna be friends, but what's important is that we get a job done and try to remember what the common ground is. We all went to work this morning to get a job done so that we could feed our families. So that's important. You know, Thank male you, Wendy. allies, definitely important. And so, Wendy, while I still have you on camera, I skipped ahead. What I meant, the first question I meant to ask you is how did you get into the trades? And once you were in the trade, how did you advance to a uh, leadership position? And then after you answer that, we're going to move on to the next person to ask that question. So how did you get into okay. trade? Well, and I how did you in, move up into leadership? I came into the construction trades back in the late 80s. And um, I, kept, I come from the um, building laborers. Back in the 80s, we had no apprenticeship program. So it was a lot harder to get into the laborers or find that platform when there's no apprenticeship program. Coming home from the military, like Ken was saying about his dad, coming into a community where there was still no jobs and um, things were limited. And I really didn't want to go to school, but I knew that I didn't come home from the military to just do nothing, you know? So I was trying to weigh out my options and I realized that they were limited. You know, even though I was a soldier, it was still limited, you know, so it was either go back to the military or try to figure this out. And um, first thing I figured out was in order to get something, you really had to be a part of the system. And when it comes to minorities, the part of the system that they choose to put us in ain't a good part of the system. So the people I saw that was moving into positions of just being able to feed themselves at the time women who were in um, programs like young mothers, people who were coming home from incarcerations or drug programs. And that didn't, you know, I didn't quite fit into that category. So I kind of felt lost for a minute, but um, I also believed that um, I had to do something, right? I was raised that you, jobs don't just knock on the door. So I took any job, you know, I never felt like I was too good for anything. And I um, worked in a hotel as a fire guard. I got that job and um, happened to be doing construction in the area. And as I was walking the floors where the construction workers were, the guys were trying to talk to me. And um, good morning, whatever the conversation was, eventually one of the brothers asked to take me out. And I told him I really wasn't interested in that. He showed me his check to impress me. And I was very impressed. And I told him that I was interested in getting that check with my name on it and how could he make that happen? So um, he invited me to a coalition up in Harlem and that's where I actually learned a lot about the industry, about why we weren't there as women, as minorities. We were there very few. And um, it was um, sad, but I was willing to fight the fight. I was a soldier already, and I already realized I wasn't going backwards. I was only moving ahead. So um, I moved with the um, community organization and got an opportunity to get on the job site as a laborer. And I also remember what my mom said is, and that was um, not to put all your eggs in one basket. So I invested in a union. I didn't just buy a book, but I wanted to learn the structure of it and see how it operated. You know, so in spite of what my brothers in the community were saying to me, I took it one step further and I said, you know what, whether they want me here or not, I'm here and you know what, it's my right. So I might as well learn how this stuff works, you know? So I was fortunate enough that, um, people took a liking to me, you know, and I didn't really have many problems. And when I did, I addressed them right away. And um, people saw me as a leader, you know, so I had those male allies, whether it was on a job site, encouraging me to go to the next job site. I even had a foreman, not even a foreman, I had a um, owner of a company who was rare, but he actually, you know, if he saw, if he walked on a job and he saw a guy miss treating me or talking to me, he nipped it in the bud. And that's really what's important. One of the things I say to my apprentices today is what goes on the job site, people don't know unless you're telling someone. And sometimes the owner of a company has no clue on how his job is being run because he has a foreman or he has supers. And if they don't bring that information back, then, you know, it's, it's really lost. And a lot of the culture that we have in our industry comes from them handling it themselves on a job site. And it's obvious that everything cannot be just handled on a job site. 
you know, and one of the things I try to share with the brothers and the sisters both is that when we make people uncomfortable, whether we, whether it be a sexual thing or a ethnical thing, it, it, it creates a whole bad vibe for the industry itself because our job is to build a building and give it back to the customer. And yeah. what, what, we, what we're doing is creating a hostile environment. You know, when people are uncomfortable and feel like they have to watch their back or not be sure the person they're working with, and you're not going to get the best out of a worker when they have all of this on their head. So, you know, it would be nice if in the industry they had a place for people to go to express that and, and resolve little things before they turn into big things. Great point. So, Wendy, let's give um, Kina an opportunity. If you could turn your camera on, Kina, and tell us how you got into the trades and also take it, taking it a step further. How did you move up into leadership? I want to get a plug in. Thank you all for putting your comments into the chat. We will um, try to address as many questions as possible. I see uh, Lisa Ransom and Jill Hauser were on the line and um, shout outs to our new section. Secretary of Labor in the chat. So thank you so much. Keep the questions in the chat going. So Wendy, tell us, how did you get into the trade and then how did you move up? Give us some advice. I'm sorry, not Wendy, Tina. Okay, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I actually uh, finished up with college. I was lucky to be able to uh, finish that up. I uh, went to work on a grant for a one-year stint, a stretch, but at that point, it was either go back to college or uh, you know, find a job and I wasn't going back to college. I started volunteering with a, a neighborhood organization that was uh, really uh, trying to rebuild some uh, uninhabitable buildings on the south side over in Bronzeville. And I thought I was doing construction and mostly we were just painting and patching, but I thought it was construction. One of the uh, women that was volunteering with me saw an article about uh, an organization called Sunbow, which was very much like Seawood is now. They, they don't exist anymore, but trying to get women into uh, three trades, the uh, laborers, the painters, and the carpenters. And I, you know, I, I went for it with Sunbow. I took to the carpentry and never looked back. So that's how I got in with the help of, a, of, of an organization very much like Seawood. Uh, I moved up. Uh, I'm glad uh, Wendy mentioned about uh, men that are allies. Uh, one of my instructors, when I was an apprentice, uh, actually contacted me when they were looking for a part-time instructor. So I did uh, try to step up and apply for that. Um, and that's how I moved into uh, being an instructor at the apprentice program. And then I just stuck it out until now I'm, I'm an administrator here. Um, but I did have allies. Uh, actually, when I got in, there weren't a lot of women in. and. Uh, most of my mentors were men. So, and I, and I did have allies and that was a big deal. Uh, so not that I didn't have the other, but you know, I did have some allies. So that's how I got in and pretty much how I moved up. That background, when I got into the apprentice program, they were looking for somebody to help with curriculum. And that's what I was doing in the job just before I started in construction uh, was curriculum development. So it was just both, uh, you know, help of a mentor and a lucky, lucky draw. Thank you so much. So moving on to Christina, if you could introduce yourself and tell us how you got into the trades and how you were able to move up. Give us some tips. Hi, um, my name is Christina Burles. I'm uh, with Plumbers Local 130 out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I got into the trades back in 98. I so happened to have met somebody that uh, was a plumber. And um, she just said, um, why don't you get in? I was trying to get out of uh, being a makeup artist. Uh, there was no future, there was no um, benefits. And I wanted something that would be a little bit more stable. So I applied for the plumbers and I applied for the electricians and somehow the plumbers chose me and I've stuck it out ever since. Um, and uh, just going back to what Wendy said, you kind of give it your all. Um, when I got into the plumbers, they took a chance on me, a girl that didn't know anything about plumbing. So I decided as a person coming in, as a woman coming in, that I was gonna give back to my union and then do everything possible for my union to, uh, to, make, it, to make it better, to make it more welcoming. And, and that's exactly what I did. Um, I, I chose to 
to help my brothers and my sisters. You know, we don't have very many sisters. When I came in, there was only two girls in, in my class and that was myself and, and my sister, Tracy. And unfortunately, Tracy's no longer a plumber anymore. And um, I took it upon myself seeing that these that this wasn't right to try to make change and to try to do something different and um, to really kind of push forward and, and get more women in. And then the biggest thing is trying to keep our women in and, and, and keep them going in this trade. It's tough, you know, uh, jobs aren't very, um, they're not out there. And, and like it was said before, you know, as being a woman of color, we are the last ones hired, but the first ones fired. So to me, and this is a role I took myself um, as being a leader, as being a true sister, is let's make so let's do something, let's make change and and move it forward, and and that is my goal. In my thank life. you, Christina. We're going to come back to you a little bit later. So, Kina, what supports do you feel that um, trades women of color? specifically need to thrive in this industry? What supports, quote unquote, do you think they need to thrive in this industry, women of color? So it is, it's a tough industry for uh, anybody to get through, but you know, specifically women and women of color. Uh, but uh, women of color need supports to get started, uh, to make it through their apprenticeship, and of course, to thrive in the trades. And I'm leaving thrive for when they pass that bar and become journeyman, then it's, it's time to really start thriving. Uh, to get started uh, in our area, there's nothing like having an organization like Chicago Women in Trades. It's made all the difference in the world here at the Carpenters. Uh, we simply would not have the women that we have now if it were not for uh, an organization like CWIT. Uh, uh, around the country though, they're not, there's not a CWIT everywhere. So uh, women need information. I'm one of those women who would never, I had no um, relatives who were in the trade and no introduction to the trade. It was no, it was not even on my radar. So we need to get the information out there to women that, you know, that this is an option for them. Not an option for everybody, but, you know, some women will definitely be able to thrive in this industry. Uh, see what provides test, what, test prep help. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of women end up going into the trades as their third, second, third, fourth uh, career. And so you have to get back into that test prep. They didn't just get out of high school. Uh, something that women need in the beginning to get started, uh, once they're an apprentice and even afterward, it will be mentoring. That's one of those things, one of those things that uh, continues to happen, mentoring from their fellow trades women and from women at the top who make it to the top as well. Uh, as well as their, uh, you know, co male co-workers, co-workers. Uh, but I think women a lot of times need more assertiveness training. Uh, we are often, often not raised to, you know, be more assertive. And I don't mean in a negative way. I just mean getting out there. You have to be a little different to be in the trades. You got to be more assertive. And I think that's something that men are trained to do more, even starting at the beginning than women. And I think see what provides that. Uh, and then financial training. Unfortunately, our, um, our apprenticeship program doesn't uh, supply as much financial training as uh, some of our apprentices need. Uh, I'm glad that uh, CWIT can do that. Uh, so those are just things that you need from an organization like CWIT, uh, but also financial support. This is the, the second thing that women need to get into the trades. There are application fees, initiation fees, dues, books, things that they need. Uh, so financial support is important. Uh, as was mentioned already, uh, child care support. Uh, again, most of these jobs, some of these jobs start at six o'clock. Some of the, uh, the apprenticeship programs are way out in the suburbs. They need child, uh, child care support so they uh, you know, can get to their training and then get to the jobs. And then of course, a biggie. These are the things that are different about construction that are, that, uh, from other types of work and that is transportation support. Uh, if you don't have a vehicle, it's almost impossible to make it in the construction trade. So uh, those loans or that initial loan a down payment to get that uh, vehicle. Uh, so those are supports to get uh, started. Oh, one last thing. And that would be possibly supplemental employment, one-time employment, just a job to wait until the trade you want is open. So if organizations are there, supports to su uh, supply that, just employment to wait because the apprenticeship programs aren't open all the time. 
So once you get into the program, you're going to need some support uh, during the apprenticeship. Mentoring is, of course, that's all the way through. Uh, employment assistance is a big deal. Uh, Chicago Women in Trades, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be working with Chicago Women in Trades on policy. Policy for the PLAs, as was mentioned by Lily, uh, CBAs and things like that. But I think we also need to uh, address private money uh, because as it is, if women are only, uh, if we only go after the public job sites, uh, if we only go after the public job sites, then all of that private uh, foundation money, private developers, uh, those jobs, those owners can put requirements uh, for women to uh, get on the job site. So I think our policy has to take both uh, public money and private. And then of course, all of the same continued financial supports while they're an apprentice, that would be uh, dues, help with dues occasionally, uh, child care support and transportation. Uh, and then also supplemental work during slow periods in construction. Some of our best apprentices make it because in the wintertime when work slows down, they can get another job doing something else, uh, driving a truck. So we need to you know, wrap around our women in that way. So that's while they're an apprentice. And then the supports that they need while uh, once they complete their apprenticeship and they move into, uh, you know, move in as journeymen, uh, that same mentoring that's always going to need be needed more employment assistance uh, it is true that construction trades you have to be paid the same amount as the the men on the job site but if you don't get the same hours you're not getting the same pay and uh, women who get uh, you know only used for a little bit on this job site or get shuffled from a job site to a job site and then laid off uh, you need that employment assistance to stay working uh, you know unless you're lucky and you get into that core crew on a, uh, with a contractor. And I think that's gotta be our focus. We gotta get our women working on core crews and emphasize that with as many contractors that they need to get that one woman, two women, three women, four women that they wanna keep working. Uh, we need that. And then of course, uh, training at, once they complete their apprenticeship, they can do more safety training, foreman and superintendent training, and even business training so they can move up through the apprenticeship. Um, those, I just want to just emphasize last, uh, last thing is the mentoring is all the way through financial support and jobs all the way through. We have to keep our women working if they're going to make it in the trades. Thank you. Thank you, Kina. And so in the chat, I know it's kind of hard to be the chat where you're presenting. Um, a lot of people are equiting, equiting uh, what you're saying and loving all the comments that you are um, providing, saying that you are right on point. Okay. Thank you. Give a, we are going to give a chance for more questions, but we want Christina to turn her camera back on and tell us a little bit about Christina. How have the national calls for racial justice, including um, from con in construction industry leaders, impact your work as a leader? The national calls for in racial injustice, including uh, construction industry leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. How has that impact your work as a leader? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, we all know what um, 2020 brought us and it was definitely an enlightenment. And for uh, what happened to uh, George Floyd, it, um, it was very sad, but I do have to admit, seeing some of our international um, unions actually speak up on it was a big difference from just the prior year in 2019, 2018. I mean, we've had a great deal of social injustices happen to people of color. So it was very important, but I do want to uh, say that uh, there were few, but they were very welcoming uh, locals that actually stepped up also. And I think we need to take notice of that. It's very important, you know, we deal more on a local level and we deal with, uh, with our brothers and sisters you know, on one-on-one -on -one and at the job sites. And it was very hard, very hard uh, for the last four years um, at job sites. I've had plenty of sisters that have um, had situations come up. So seeing our internationals actually speak out to it was important, but I think it's just as important for the locals our, at the local level for our brothers to actually speak out. And this goes back to having our, our male allies. I mean, they have to be true male allies and actually take that role and speak out and 
and really kind of push that norm. You know, um, construction isn't easy and especially is not easy for women and especially not easy for women of color. Um, we get a lot of brunt um, of a lot of uh, different kind of um, wording, you know, just, just being called out of our names constant. So um, when it comes to our allies, we really need those guys to not just say, hey, I'm here for you and I'm here to support you, and, but to literally have our back and come up and stand shoulder to shoulder with us and be like, hey, this, is, this isn't right and you know what, and speak out in that manner. Um, but I do, I, I, like I said before, uh, our, the national call outs were great. Um, there were a few of the local call outs which really impressed me and I was, uh, I was glad to see but I, we definitely need a few more, you know. Um, the biggest saying right now um, that a lot of people are using is, oh, I don't see, I don't see color. So that's, it makes it okay. And unfortunately, you know what? You don't see color, you don't see me. Right. And that's what it comes down to. And we all need to be seen. We all, when we, when we join a union, we're joining a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And the meaning of that is we are family, we are tight, we are a unit. And if you don't see me, I'm no longer part of your unit. Right, you're invisible. Thank you, Christina. So now we're gonna take each panelist have about a minute and a half so we can get to our audience questions. We want you to ask, us, um, ask Wendy Webb first. Um, the American Rescue Plan, Wendy, included $10 billion for state and local governments for infrastructure and broadband investments. Are we expecting more infrastructure investments moving forward? And what should we, what can be done or what should be done to make sure that black women and Latinas are also benefiting from the jobs created from these funds? Again, give us about a minute and a half, Wendy, and then we're gonna to go to the next panel. Well, first and foremost, we need to look at our counterparts um, that are actually doing it like Layuna, you know, our organizations, union organization, building trades, they work with the communities. They have a very diverse membership and it starts right there. You know, we're using federal funded money and I don't see why you don't use the people that's gonna use the money the right way from the beginning. And we need people to police, you know, we are talking about putting it in writing, that sounds great, you know, but it's been in writing before. And the writing shouldn't say make an effort, but it should say make it happen or it, it won't happen, you know, and that needs to happen when the, before the ground breaks and people need to have that language. We need to have people policing the police because we have a bunch of people out there that ain't doing their jobs. Thank you. Thank you, um, Wendy. And now we're gonna go to Kina. So $10 billion for infrastructure. Uh, we know more is coming for state and local governments. How can we make sure the black and Latinas are included a part of getting some of those jobs? to do infrastructure work. Yeah, I'm glad we're ending on yeah. that note because you're right, that work is coming up. Uh, so we're looking at a couple of things and the couple of things are, is there are some best practices out there. There's some things that are happening on the East Coast and the West Coast where they have actually put some language in about direct hiring from pre-apprenticeship programs for those trades that don't have enough uh, all the way to having um, a PLA that has goals in it. Uh, that does only works if there's enforcement. Enforcement can only happen when there's transparency. So no matter what, no matter what kind of regulations you have, we need to have where it's posted, where people can see. If you have a goal of this many people and a contractor, or these many people of color, these women of color, and a contractor signs, uh, you know, signs a contract, and they say they're gonna supply this, but when they, when, the, when they make monthly reports, and that's key too, monthly reports that show that they're not living up to you know, the goals that they said that they were gonna to try to meet, what happens then? Does it impact them on getting future jobs? Uh, are there, you know, however they work that. I mean, there are best practices that we need to, to implement, but reporting monthly, uh, and transparency where everybody can see what's happening, who's getting what, and by the hour. We're not just talking about, I hired this person on this job. How many hours did they work on that job? How many hours went to women of color? How many hours went to you know black women, Latinas? Uh, how many hours went to people of color? That sort of thing. We need to see it 
and have everybody reporting the same and for everybody to be able to see. So reporting, enforcement, and transparency, that's what we need. Uh, thank you, Kina. So Christina, $10 billion for <laughs> local and government uh, infrastructure. How can Latinas and uh, uh, African-American women get some of those jobs? Good jobs. Well, first, um, just to go off what my sister Kina just said, it's true transparency. We have to make people accountable. You can't just say we're going to hire somebody and it's minority hours. And then once those hours are up, they're gone. You have to get that investment in for that person. It's retention. You know, like I said, my sister, when I was going through the apprenticeship, she's no longer a plumber. Why? Because we're not trying to retain women. Well, let's get back to it. Let's make, let's hold these people accountable. If you're going to put the money, invest in the person, invest in that female, invest because you, it amazing things can happen and you will get amazing returns. You know, we hold people accountable every single day when you go to work. You have to make sure you, you do a certain amount of jobs. Well, let's hold the contractors. Let's hold these people that are holding these contracts accountable to us, to giving us the jobs, to giving us that opportunity, to making us a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So we're going to turn it over, I believe, back to Lark. And she's going to um, have the um, facilitator go through the questions. You all can start, continue to put your questions in the chat. There's a lot of useful information. Uh, Lauren Sugarman is putting the best practices website also on this. You can get further information that's available. Uh, people are putting job apprenticeship opportunities in the website. So please check, I'm sorry, not the website, in the chat. Turning it over to Lark. We want our panelists to please stay on board so um, you all be able to answer these questions. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Angela. Again, thank you, Angela, Wendy, uh, Kina, Christina, and Lily. That was very helpful as we think about the best practices to support trades women and give them opportunities to also advance in this industry. Um, so now we'll look at some audience questions. And at this point, we also invite all of the panelists to turn on their videos. Yes. Okay. So the first one is, which and how are employers actively addressing the needs of parenting and caregiving for employees? Our story was powerful, I agree. Well, um, I'd like to speak to that because uh, Zara is my fellow sister from Local 130. Um, I just want to say one thing. Uh, the biggest thing that we need to recognize when coming to this is not only the need for maternity. When it comes to men and our insurance, they get everything. We're here fighting for uh, birth control, for, uh, for maternity uh, leave, you know, all these things that when it comes to a man, it's not even a second thought. Why? Because they're not the ones having the baby. Here we are, we're getting in the field. Um, I've had uh, several of my brothers from different locals even come to me asking me how to handle the situation. Remember, what Zara said is true. We are not handicapped because we are pregnant. Women years before us would have babies till the, I mean, would work till the very end till their baby came out. We can, we are resilient. We have children. So we have to realize that no mother's gonna harm their baby and that we're gonna be out there and we, we will take care of it. Um, but we also have to understand that this is a definite need. Uh, Childcare, maternity is a need for, if we, if we wanna have a future, just worldwide, you know, for plumbers, we protect the health of the nation. What nation are you going to have if you're not going to have a mother having a baby? Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So the next one is, are there any, um, are there pre-apprenticeship or workforce development organizations that have successfully figured out how to provide childcare support for women uh, preparing to enter the trades or working in the trades? And obviously, Kina spoke to um, CWIT, um, but are there any other ones that we want to amplify? I don't know of any, but I'd love to hear about an organization that has even trades women when they're not working uh, available to help, you know, take other trades women's kids to the, you know, the daycare or things like that. I mean, I think there's some creative solutions. I, I don't know of any, but I would love to hear if anybody out there 
uh, has uh, worked this out. Uh, we'd love to hear about that. Hey, Lark, I do want to put a plug in. I do want to put a plug in for our America Job Centers, which were formerly called One Stop Centers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all over the country. Your taxes are paying for it anyway. If you qualify, they will help you find apprenticeship opportunities. They will help you um, get a uh, um, transportation referrals, child care referrals, tools, equipment, and training. Um, some are better than others, but they are, that too is out there. So I put that in there, careeronestop.org, and then you put in your zip code and it will tell you the nearest one. I would suggest that you go to a one that says comprehensive because there's more resource available at a comprehensive center. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. So this next one is what civic education processes are provided for trades women of color to help them develop public policy leadership experience? Is civic, is civic education a part of the apprenticeship training process? Whoever would like to take Our that union question. has uh, developed a, uh, an online training, uh, it's Constitution 101, uh, that we're now requiring all of our apprentices uh, in one quarter to go through this training. And it's, it's about, you know, it is a revisit of what they probably were supposed to cover in high school, but uh, it has an emphasis on working and uh, labor unions and things like that. So that that's out there. And I, I'm sorry to go back. Uh, Liz Skidmore just uh, put in a uh, something in the chat about uh, child care uh, child care in Boston, and uh, there's a website Care That Works. It, I I didn't know that, so that's good to know. The next question is, any recommendations on how or where to hire former veterans? Wendy, I don't know if you want to take that question, if you um, would like to. Well, in New York City, we work with Hell Mr. Hard Hats. Um, I know a couple of years ago, everybody was working with them, but then they lost their funding. Um, we still took them on, and um, we encourage people to tell people they know who are looking for jobs in our vets. To plug into that, I believe they have a website and they could actually plug into the website and they um talk, eventually someone reaches back out to them and try to see what their interests are. And sometimes they do symposiums where other trades come together and we'll all talk to them. So um, there is a program around Mr. Hard Hats. Unfortunately, it wasn't there when I um, started, but it's there now and it should be utilized. Um, for the UA, which is uh, my international local, um, they ha also have a VIP program for veterans uh, to get into either plumbing, pipe fitting, steam fitting, um, all those metal uh, pipe trades. We also work with Hell Mr. Hardheads. We give uh, preferential uh, entry uh, to our uh, veterans with a DD-214. So especially if anybody knows any women who came out of the military and want to get into uh, you know, the, the trades, I would say definitely that's the way to go. Uh, again, they get preferential entry into our program if they've been in the military, if they completed, you know, their, you know uh, or they still in, are still in the military. This next question should be for everyone. Um, as a general contractor, how can they work to recruit and also retain women of color? <laughs> well, as a general contractor, first of all, they should just go to their local unions. Union halls usually have um, women there. And, um, you know, I think if you need women on your job, you should actually speak to your business, the business manager of the local unions and let them know what the demand of the job is. And I'm sure they'll fulfill it. We would love to have a, a contractor um, come in and take some first year women uh, and mentor them, right? And keep them working, insist on additional training if they need it. You know, we have training at the apprentice program that they say, well, 
you're, we want to keep you, but you, you need to take a little bit more training, you know, have them take more training. Uh, but, you know, take one or two women and, you know, mentor them and get them through their apprenticeship and, you know, put them on that core crew. I can't uh, stress it enough. We have enough men who are on core crews where the company just takes that core crew and just moves them from job site to job site. Uh, they should have women on all of those core crews. Uh, we have a number of women who get all the way up to their fourth year of apprenticeship and then stall out, unable to get hired, et cetera. We would love for a contractor to call us and say, you know, let me have your best fourth year, you know, apprentice woman, and I'm going to, you know, invest in her. And we would, we would love to do that. Uh, so all it takes is a little bit of interest. It takes some time. It's going to take some mentoring and it's going to take a little bit of commitment. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, Eva Schmidt from Chicago Women in Trades is working on the uh, the Carpenters, uh, Chicago Carpenter Partnership, where we have two companies, um, Quality First and Passion, that have made a commitment to move their women to move to 20% of their uh, workforce to women. Uh, Quality First is is exceeded that already, so they made the commitment. That's what we need. We need our other contractors to make that commitment. And uh, kudos to, to Eva for all the work that she put into it. But we do have those two contractors. We just need more contractors to step up and make that commitment, a percentage of their workforce be women. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, my sister Kina here. Um, we need the commitment. We need to hold them accountable and we have to have them make that investment. The biggest thing is just to make the investment. You know, getting into the trades, um, you know, especially especially for our locals, you know, it's brothers, sisters, uncles, uh, you know, it's somebody that's in the family and they have no problem. Let's bring them along. Oh, we're going to keep them. Oh, that's so-and-so's brother. Do that same thing for, for a female. Invest, invest in that female. Teach them what you know. I mean, we're all sponges. Like I said, when I came in, I was a makeup artist when I signed up back in 98. Can you see this came walking into the plumber's hall and said, I want to be a plumber. So I, I took the time. I, I was a sponge and I was lucky. I was very lucky being a Hispanic female in an all male white crew that I had a guy that said, you know, nothing. We are going to show you everything. I got, like I said, I got lucky here. I am 20 years later going on 21. So we just need somebody to take that time to say, uh, you are gonna learn and I'm going to show you and get that from the contractors and hold them accountable for doing it. And we'll ask, we'll go through two more questions. Um, what can be done in the school system to promote these kinds of careers for young women of color? Well, I believe um, you got to start at the junior high school level um, because they need to, they need exposure before they get to high school because some high schools have specialty high schools where they could actually go into trades and come out of high school straight into an apprenticeship program. But um, if you don't reach these young women prior to high school, you're not going to get them until they're about 23, if you're lucky, 30 after they done tried everything else and realized they can't take care of their family without this. Thank you, Wendy. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, we, we uh, partner with a lot of high schools uh, to try to do webinars. Well, now everything is Zoom meetings and Google Meets and all of that. Uh, but we used to bring high schools in for tours and things like that. Our high schools in our area are still it, even in this day and age, just so focused on college. And I think it's a kind of a statewide thing where they only get, you know, they only get points for how many of their students, you know, leave high school and, and go into college. Post-secondary education is not part of the conversation for a lot of these high schools. So I, I think uh, some of the high schools are changing where, you know, they're having a better attitude toward uh, going into the trades and, you know, giving people options. But a lot of our high schools are still you know, even with even knowing the outcomes that a lot of people are not completing college, they're still like that is the only option that people have. So we, of course, are open to, uh, you know, partnering with any high school uh, to get that information out to the students. Uh, Cisco, 
shout out to Johnetta and Cisco uh, for organizing that in our area where we, you know, we're constantly speaking to high schools. Uh, so part of that is the mentality at the high school and, uh, be, you know, giving more options to more of their uh, students. Um, and yeah, we not only visiting high school, I think uh, the biggest change is um, what we just got this year on, in January 20, 2021, um, our first female vice president. Let's have leaders, international, local, in the schools, in the training centers that look like us because that's what's gonna get a, a little girl motivated when she sees, oh, look, She's a female, she's a woman of color. She looks just like me and that's what she's doing. And I wanna see what, I wanna know about that. I wanna learn about that. And I'm gonna also give a shout out to my sister, Judeline Cassidy with her little program, Tools and Tierras. I mean, that's, that's another good little camp, getting little girls, grade schoolers, just to learn about it. You know, we, we, we as women in the trades have to step up and start talking about it and be out there and be the face for construction. Thank you. Also, I think we should also look into like um, clubs like sports clubs, gyms. You find strong women there. So I think they'll be good for the trades. And finally, um, we have a question regarding, can you all recommend any particular strategies um, that you may find effective when creating a working group to work on these issues of um, engaging women of color? Um, I will say for, for my uh, female committee, um, it is not an official committee. We do have an unofficial committee, but uh, just being that support, remember there's gonna be ebbs and flows to everything. You're gonna have everybody that wants to commit and will be a part of it. And all of a sudden things happen in people's life. We had a whole year of COVID where no one could see anybody, couldn't go out or do anything. But you have to just give that commitment. If you're going to do it, give it your all and just continue. Sometimes it's going to be great. Sometimes it's not going to be so great. But no matter what, someone needs that mentorship. Someone's going to need that support. And you have to remember how it was when you first started. So you need to be that support for somebody else. It's important um, mentor also important to encourage. It's important to um, let them know the opportunities that are available after apprenticeship so that they're not turning out and 10 years later, they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do because their bodies are breaking down. You know, one of the things we try to do is encourage them all to just get involved with the union, you know, and eventually you'll find yourself and you'll find a bunch of people that don't mind mentoring you. We also uh, uh, got together with a lot of a uh, group of carpenters. I think it's important to uh, ask the women what they want. You know, we, we get a lot of things, uh, taking classes together, you know, skill advancement classes together, uh, uh, volunteering for the union. Uh, thank you, Wendy, that was a great idea because uh, we have, you know, Christmas in April and we've had our women go out and volunteer as a group. Uh, that's, that's a big deal. Um, that is always a source of mentoring, and you just got to get the women together first. Uh, Zoom meetings, notwithstanding, that can happen, uh, you know, Zoom meetings, uh, just to get them started. And hopefully this will all uh, <laughs> uh, graduate to something better where we can actually uh, get together and volunteer again. So, uh, but the women will come up with their own ideas of what they want, what they need, you know, if we can get them together. Thank you, Keena. Would anyone else like to comment on it before we conclude? All right. Well, thank you, Angela, Wendy, Keena, Christina, and Lily. Um, again, that was very insightful. Um, and I hope everyone, um, all of our audience members are energized to not only continue these conversations, but also enact practices and policies that support Black, Latina, Afro, Latina, and other tradeswomen of color. Our panelists mentioned the importance of allyship in this work. So I just want to challenge each of you to consider the ways that you can be an ally within your respective roles. If you haven't already, please check out the brief at iwpr.org and womensequitycenter.org. 
Be safe, be well, and we look forward to your feedback. Thank you all.